Good morning. I, I think we're live now. My name is Kevin Barron. I'm the executive editor of Defense One, and welcome to the SEPA Forum. Uh, we are thrilled to present our first panel of the forum, first panel of the morning, the title of which is The Future of the European Security Architecture, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, why not start off with something easy like that? Um, we have a good panel of guests uh, that I'm thrilled to have you join us to hear from uh, with Annegret Kramp Karrenbauer, the former Federal Minister of Defense uh, from Germany, and co currently co chair of the International Leadership Council at SEPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis. We also have uh, Steph Twitty, who is former Deputy Commander of European Command. Uh, he is also a distinguished fellow at SEPA and the founder of Twitty and Associates LLC. And I believe we're to be joined by Alexander Stubb, the former Prime Minister of Finland, uh, who I don't see on our screen yet, but hopefully will be joining us soon. Um, so let's get right into it. I think we'll, what we'll do for, for those of you watching is we'll, we'll talk the news of the day, of course, about Ukraine and the war at hand. Uh, we'll talk about the current state of uh, European security, the European security architecture that's uh, named in this uh, title of the session and maybe work our way out and around the world uh, talking about the United States, about China, about technologies, about um, other future needs. Uh, but uh, let's let's get it started off. And since we have a defense minister and the defense minister, I think outranks the former deputy commander. We'll, we'll begin with you, Annegret. Uh, if you could take us take us off. The question, the, the big news of the last week is Putin's mobilization, his partial mobilization, as he's calling it, others are calling it conscription. It's a draft. It's a desperate measure, and it and it reveals uh, everything going wrong for the Russians, everything going right for Ukraine and those supporting Ukraine to support um, their the defense of this invasion on their country. What is your take about? What is your feeling about this mobilization? Mm -hmm. What worries you most about it uh, that maybe we haven't heard yet? And speak from your own country. What what new? What must be done uh, from Germany and from NATO to to make a change in in this war that that has been going on for you know months and months mm -hmm. now? So um, hello, Kevin. Hello, um, uh, everyone, and good afternoon from uh, a very rainy uh, Germany. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to be part of this uh, session. So, what does um, Russia's mobilization mean? Um, I think the mobilization came uh, only after Ukraine's successful counteroffensive. And uh, it came uh, together with the announcement of so called referendums in some uh, Russian occupied uh, regions. So um, I think there are two possible. Uh, interpretations or uh, scenarios. Um, the first one, the worst one, is um, when you combine this uh, with the um, Russian threat of uh, nuclear strikes, I think you can uh, see uh, the growing influence of um, and pressure of uh, hardliners uh, who are critical of uh, President Putin. Um, these hardliners are confident that uh, NATO will not fighting for Ukraine when the going gets tough. And in a scenario that is only slightly better, the measures taken uh, will be used uh, to force negotiations on uh, Putin's terms. But um, whether you go by these uh, interpretations or not, um, to me, the Russian decisions uh, in the recent weeks um, show one thing very, very, very clearly. Putin is willing to waste human lives on a tremendous scale, even in the long run. And uh, I think he tried to put under pressure the most powerful skill um, that we uh, have uh, delivered uh, as NATO and uh, European countries in the last months, um, our determination and our cohesion. And uh, the challenge for the next uh, and the coming months will be under the influence and the impression of uh, rising inflation, of uh, worries about energy supply. Um, Will we stand uh, together? I think this is uh, the bet that Putin uh, had uh, made. But um, this bet comes for him with political costs in the form of risk because it brings the war into 
every Russian family. And right now we see the ongoing protests and escape attempts in Russia. So I think what we have to do, uh, especially as uh, mem NATO member states and uh, member states of the European community, and uh, especially as Germany, we have um, to take a double, um, a double approach. One is to provide um, the Ukraine with the military equipment that is needed. And this is especially an ongoing and um, an hard political discussion here in, in Germany. And on the other hand, we have a political task to make uh, sure that we can stand together, that there are reasonable um, political answers to deal with rising inflation, to deal with worries about energy uh, supply and so on. So I think um, it's uh, a complicated situation and it's uh, a challenge uh, when I see uh, the next uh, coming month. Thank you, Minister. And uh, if, as we continue, I'll say welcome to Alexander Stubb. Hello, sir. Glad to have you with us. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me and sorry for the technical glitch. Nice to be here. No worries, no worries. Uh, nobody, nobody judges anybody here about our technical capabilities. <laughs> um, but for everyone at home, this is the former Prime Minister of the of the Republic of Finland and now Director of the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute. Um, we're talking about uh, sort of the 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 re reactions to what's happening in Ukraine um, and the current news of the most recent big news that everyone's talking about this mobilization so um steph i had you lined up for the next answer as as a as a as a former military commander the former deputy commander of ucom the Euro u.s european command for those who don't follow all my acronyms um uh, what's your what's your reaction to what you just heard especially i'd like you to comment if you can on the notion of giving Ukraine the weapons they need, because what they need has been a real a point of controversy and, and, and a separation between some countries within NATO, especially the farther east you get closer to where the war the threat is. Uh, let me just say a couple of things there, Kevin. Number one, I think we all know that uh, President Putin, he's out of options. And so being out of options, he's got two things that he can really think of pretty quickly. Number one is to throw more troops at the problem. And that's what he's essentially doing with the 300,000 uh, uh, man call up. He's throwing more troops at the problem. And then the second thing he has uh, that all autocrats normally do when they get uh, put into a corner is to saber rattle his nuclear weapons capability. And so we cannot be deterred by that. Yes, we should have some concern by it, but we should not be deterred by it. the saber rattling of his nuclear uh, capability and so forth. What, what I will tell you is he's lost approximately 800, excuse me, 80,000 troops in this battle due to casualties or killed. That's a significant amount. And so the Ukrainians have to continue this momentum. Uh, they've been able to take back approximately 8,000 kilometers of terrain. In order to continue this momentum, they're going to need continued support from the West. The weapons that uh, you see the West that have given them, they've made a significant difference on the battlefield. The HIMARS, absolutely phenomenal weapon system. It has allowed the Ukrainians to not only strike uh, command and control systems, logistical systems, strike back at their artillery system. It's the same thing with the drones, giving them the ability to gather intel for locations of high value targets, uh, providing them the, the ability to protect their own soldiers. And so uh, as they continue this momentum, as they continue this fighting, anytime you're on the offense, you're rapidly burning through your ammunition, and you're rapidly burning through your military hardware. Things are gonna break, particularly in these winter months, things are definitely gonna break. And so I would hope that NATO and our, our countries, not just the 30, soon to be 32, but the 40 countries that have contributed to this fight, they will continue this 
so we can further see the momentum by the Ukrainians and, and make sure that they're sustained throughout the winter months and until this fight is over. Thank you. You know, I, I'm going to come back to you on the on those weapon systems because the Ukrainians are asked for a lot more. But before we do, let's sure. get to our third panelist for some introductory remarks. Uh, Alexander Stubb, Stubb um, please, uh, your thoughts on this mobilization. What's your feeling about it? What, what worries you most about it? We've all heard that, you know, these the reaction that it, it reveals Putin's desperation. What's what's the thing that worries you the most about it? And um what do, what do governments need to do next? And maybe you want to speak a little bit too about NATO expansion. We're going to get into that as well. Sure. I mean, I guess the first observation is to make that I, I think we're entering a new phase uh, in the war. Uh, I think the mobilization was something that Putin was trying to uh, avoid as far as he possibly could, uh, but forced with a situation whereby roughly 150,000 troops have not been able to manage an invasion uh, of Ukraine and the holding up of the positions uh, for over the past few months, he had to do something about it. Uh, and I think uh, if I was Putin at this particular moment, I'd be quite worried because if we look at the on the ground reaction to the mobilization, it was what we expected, a pushback. The war was fine until it came to the backyard of the Moscovites or the St. Petersburg. We've seen a lot of activity um, at the Finnish-Russian border in the past few days. Um, people trying to uh, avoid the mobilization and moving out. Uh, we've seen that at the Kazakhstan border, many other places as well. Is it a um, you know, sign of desperation? I would say yes, it is. Uh, this could be spelling the beginning of the end of, of the war. Uh, and I think in the past few weeks, we've for the first time had realistic hopes of the capacity of Ukraine actually to push back. Uh, I think we have to realize a couple of more things. We are in this for the long haul. You know, Putin is not going down uh, except kicking and screaming. So he's not going to give in on this. And we're not looking, um, you know, at a regime change anytime soon. And in any case, if we would there would be no guarantees of that regime change being in any which way softer than uh, the current uh, leadership of, of uh, Russia. The final point I wanted to make is on, on uh, you know, the, the threat of using uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, some people say here he's bluffing and the last thing you do in poker is to say that I'm not bluffing, then you know that you are. Uh, but I would be a little bit more careful on that. You know, we we're seeing a dictator um, who is quite desperate, and we should probably expect the unpredictable. So I think the Americans are doing exactly the right thing about, you know, having uh, informal dialogue with the Russians of, of taking this threat seriously, rather than saying that, you know, he'll, he won't be, he won't be uh, doing that. Um, a final point, uh, you mentioned NATO expansion. You know, uh, I've been an advocate of Finnish NATO membership for the better part of 30 years. Uh, I've been in a distinct minority of 20% of the population. Um, uh, and uh, I never thought that the reason that Finland would join NATO was Putin. Uh, because what Putin basically tried to achieve, uh, he achieved exactly the opposite. So he wanted to Russify Ukraine, became European. He wanted to split Europe, never seen it more united than now, he wanted to split the transatlantic partnership, it's back with a vengeance. He wanted to split NATO, it's back to its original purpose. And the icing of the cake, of course, is Finnish and Swedish NATO membership, which will strengthen, uh, obviously, security around the Baltic Sea region, but the alliance as a whole, because Finland, as you will well know, has a mandatory military service, 900,000 in reserves, 280,000 mobilized at wartime, 62 F-18s, just bought 64 F-35s, one of the strongest air-to-land, land-to-air missile defense systems. And it's not exactly that we have that stuff to protect ourselves from Stockholm. <laughs> uh, that's right. Hey, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I've heard, it's, it sounds encouraging for a minute and then it sounds discouraging. So what I'm hearing from all of you is a little bit of, uh, you just use the phrase, this is the beginning of the end. 
but then also said Putin's in it for the long haul or his regime is in it for the long haul. Even if Putin somehow loses power, who replaces him may continue the same long haul that that, you know, so this this larger conflict is is most people, at least the three of you seem to think is going to be with us for a long time, is going to continue to define, again, the the topic of the panel, European security architecture. But stick within stick with Ukraine for a, a couple more minutes. Uh, in, in the near term, square this circle, or you know, uh, help help me help me, uh, you know, figure this out. If, if is this the end of is this the beginning of the end, or is this a, a more more of the same to come? If Putin is threatening nuclear weapons, is he's he's willing to call up his his country? Is doesn't that mean he's willing to do anything to at least keep the Donbass, at least keep this conflict going? Uh, Steph, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, first of all, we all have to understand that this is a war of attrition. And let me just uh, make sure I clarify when I say war of attrition. And so when we first started this war, the Ukrainians had somewhere between 200,000 and 250,000 soldiers on the ground defending their country. And the Russians invaded with about that same amount in terms of numbers. And when you fight a force and you're about at the same uh, capacity between numbers, that's gonna be a back and forth battle. If you remember, Kevin, the Colin Powell doctrine is you always wanna attack with overwhelming combat power so you can squash a nap. In other words, destroy your enemy. And in, in both cases, we don't have this right now. So you're gonna have this back and forth One day you're gonna wake up and the Russians are gonna be succeeding tactically on the battlefield. And the next day you're gonna wake up and the Ukrainians are gonna be succeeding tactically on the battlefield. And it's gonna be this back and forth. It's gonna take a point to where we get to some type of exhaustion before someone's gonna come to the doggone bargaining table. And when that exhaustion occurs, it's gonna be the person or the, uh, the country that's got the position of strength that's going to have the upper hand at the bargaining table. So to answer your question, I see this war not only taking months, but perhaps years. Uh, and so we need to be prepared to fight this war for the long run, given that we don't have the ratio, and it's going to be hard to kick the Russians out of about 18% of the country, given that the Ukrainians are not in the large numbers and cannot create the mass to completely destroy that particular force. So that's the way I see the battlefield. How how about the others of you? I mean, to to me, that that sounds kind of like a a call or at least an excuse for those who want to, to send greater capabilities to Ukraine, not just HIMARS, maybe TACMs, maybe fighter jets, uh, maybe, you know, even air cover from other countries, something more than than just these de- mostly defensive capabilities that, you know, that some people think are just prolonging a conflict, not providing that significant upper hand that Steph was talking about. So um, perhaps, Kevin, um, I would like um, to say I agree with uh, uh, Stephen. We, we all, I think we all hope for uh, a, a very um, quick end of this uh, of this war but uh, i think we have to prepare ourselves for an, a, a very long one and um i think that um ukraine um showed in uh, the past that uh, it's able to uh, to gain military um uh, victories and to gain territory uh, when it uh, uh, when and if it uh, had uh, the uh, the armaments and uh, the equipment that it's needed, and to focus on our national debate uh, here in in Germany, we are discussing uh, especially about uh, armored vehicles and about uh, tanks. And um, I'm convinced if you want to do something heartfully, uh, you find uh, ways and solutions. And I know that uh, there are uh, many voices in in Germany, um, even from the governmental uh, parties, um, supporting uh, this idea of providing 
um, what needed uh, uh, to uh, to Ukraine. And uh, today, uh, Ambassador uh, Ambassador uh, Heusten from the Munich Security Conference, uh, I think, has proposed a, a way to deliver. Um, urgently needed tanks to on at European level. Uh, it involves the creation of a, a consortium by all European countries that own uh, tanks that own the Leopard and Germany could take the lead. I think this is a very good idea and they hope that uh, this idea will be successful here on the national political debate. Thank you for reminding Yeah, tanks is also on the table. Uh, we hear that here in Washington as well. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. Kevin, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's kind of easy. We're, I, I think we're a panel of full agreement. I mean, I, I always agree with, uh, you know, American commanders and, and uh, the former defense ministers of Germany. That's absolutely clear. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, you really have two camps here um, in, in, in the global conversation at the moment. One is what I call the peace camp and the other one is the justice camp. The peace camp is the one that wants peace immediately and at all costs. Uh, and then the justice camp is one who says that, no, actually, we want to see this uh, go to the end. Uh, and I think the only way in which we can bring it to the end, uh, because, I, you know, peace negotiations are not imminent or possible. I mean, you know, Zelensky is in absolutely no position uh, to, to do that, nor would he want to. Uh, so what can we do from the West? provide them with all the possible military equipment and ammunition that we possibly can. It is, it, it's an easy way out for us because I do think this war is too big to fail. I, I, I don't think that you know, Zelensky and his team are exaggerating when they're saying that this is a fight for freedom, uh, democracy, um, et, et, et cetera, and, and, and you know, for, for, for Western institutions, for international norms and international institutions. So. We just need to support. And of course, you know, if I hear that uh, Christoph Heusken has come up with an idea, it has to be a good idea and well thought. So if Europe can provide a consortium on that, I, I, I think that would be great. So everything in our part, I mean, it's sort of, it, it's, you know, I, I want to paraphrase Mario Draghi, soon to be former prime minister here in Italy. You know, it, we need to use the same phrase, whatever it takes. That's what we need to provide the Ukrainians with. And that's the only solution here. So whatever it takes, and uh, we, I hear we need to support, we need to support. I hear that from the, all three of you. And I frankly, I hear that from world leaders uh, consistently. What I also hear, though, is that the, but the publics of all of our countries uh, don't necessarily agree. Right. We are still just a couple years uh, out from the Trump era here in the United States, the Brexit era in Europe. Populism and nationalism is, uh, is alive and well. Sweden knows it. Italy knows it with their recent elections. So talk to me a little bit about either either from your own countries or generically uh, in the entire transatlantic alliance, the, what you think about and, and whether this is important and what to do about it. The fact that large per percentages of, of our countries um, either don't want to be uh, involved in this war, or they don't support massive or continu continuation of arms or, or non-military aid uh, uh, to come, at least on the right wing here in the United States. Um, that, you know, this, this uh, kind of battle of the soul, as, as President Biden likes to call it often, um, between being world leaders who see, as you said, a, a fight for justice versus world leaders who are America firsters or Europe first or whatever your country is first um, that think, you know what, this is a perfect example of, of what not to be involved in. How, how worried are you about what the people think versus what the leaders need to do or want to do to work their way toward, you know, a, a, a lasting peace and a victory? Well, I, if, if I may, well, reverse. So, um, I mean, I was probably a little bit more worried uh, during the summer uh, when I think there was an element of war fatigue kicking in and things were not looking that good for Ukraine. But immediately when Ukraine started, you know, the pushback in Kharkov and, and elsewhere, uh, I think people feel a little bit more comfortable about it. I don't know what kind of data you have, but if we look at the opinion polls here in Europe, we're still steadfastly public opinion in favor of Ukraine uh, against Russia. Things might change a little bit with the winter coming. Uh, and, you know, if it's a cold winter, we're looking at inflation, we're looking at high energy prices, we're looking at high food prices. 
Uh, and what do we usually do in that situation? We start looking at ourselves rather than what's going on uh, in the war. That's, by the way, could be potentially one of the deterrents for not using nuclear weapons, because if Putin uses nuclear weapons, you know, he has lost the international game, uh, you know, 100 percent. You know, it, it's just too big of a step for, for him. And then there will be, you know, overwhelming support. I still think that things have gone quite comfortably. Remember that we're in the process of isolating Russia totally, politically, economically, financially, uh, energy, uh, sports, culture, travel, you know, visa bans, uh, you name it. Um, now, uh, Putin is starting to use um, ecological or environmental terrorism. Uh, by letting out gas, by breaking up Nord Stream 1 and 2. So, you know, I think public opinion is very solidly in favor of the Ukrainians. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about it, but it's very important for political leaders to communicate the price of peace and the price of war. That's what they need to continue to do. So far, so good, I'd say. Um, Kevin, Kevin, if I may uh, continue, is this okay for you? Yes, please. So, yeah, okay. Um, because um, I would like to say it's quite normal on such, uh, in, on, on such crucial moments and situations that uh, there is a an, an, an very strong ongoing public discussion. Uh, it's, for me, it's normal in a democracy. And we have, uh, Alexander said that uh, right now we have to communicate uh, very, very clear. And I think uh, President Putin and his uh, Minister of Defense uh, made clear that uh, this war is not just a war against Ukraine. It's a war against what they called the West. And so we have to see and to understand um, if Ukraine um, uh, fail, then uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have no peace. We have a problem in Europe and in the Western world. And um, therefore, I think we have to make this uh, very, very clear. And uh, on the other hand, we have, especially as uh, national governments, we have to provide uh, when it comes to the fears of people rising uh, uh, energy costs and so on, we have to provide um, uh, reasonable political answers. This is uh, why it's so important for me as it is to um, provide uh, weapons to Ukraine. So I think this is uh, what, we, what we have uh, to do on both sides. It's a good reminder. Providing reasonable answers and solutions are just as important as providing weapons to Ukraine. That's uh, not a phrase you hear often from, from defense ministers. Uh, Steph, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, if I could follow up, uh, Kevin. I have to say that I travel around the country a lot here in the U.S., and I continue to see steadfast support. You have to remember and I'm going to take you back to World War II. The Americans have lost a lot of blood and treasure in Europe. And, and so it's in our best interest to see peace and stability on the European continent. You have the two largest countries in Europe that are, are fighting against each other. And that could easily spill over to the entire continent. If we're not careful and not watching this closely. And so I think the, the U.S., uh, the people of, of America will continue to support this war. I am not seeing even any, any wavering. I think everyone here understands it's in our best interest to do so. And so I just say we just continue to, to support the Ukrainians and see this through. Well, I, I agree with you, and I, I should have come armed with with the most current of statistics and data. You're you're right, Alexander. But I I just I asked the question with the thought in the back of my head that you know in the United States, if you turn on Fox News, the most popular uh, cable television political show at night, you'll see Tucker Carlson in the most popular TV show and in, in television and broadcast television for politics. Uh, really pushing back, it just still saying th this is a war the United States should not be in and questioning every motive behind it. That's just politics. And we're going into a midterm election in the United States. Uh, yeah. But that's why I brought that up. With with just 10 minutes to go, I, I want to I want to give us a chance to get off of just Ukraine and the larger question of the future of European autonomy. Um, 
And you know, which kind of plays into what we're talking about. What what are what are the what are publics want? What what are the what are the voters uh, want uh, uh, as far as as the future of NATO, the future of the Transatlantic Alliance, uh, the the threat or perceived or real from China in the Indo-Pacific. And what I'm interested in as a as a news editor as a reporter is uh, the solutions and and the and the the um, you know laws and policies that are being offered to deal with this. So on one end, you have uh, in the United States at least. Uh, some lawmakers calling for massive increases to our militaries, saying that, you know, the, the United States has nowhere near the capabilities needed to confront or defend any kind of China's China assault uh, to defend Taiwan as, as the, the, the feared Asian version of what we saw in, in, in Ukraine happening. Um, on the other side, you, you have a, a another camp saying this is long overdue. Uh, Trump, uh, for all of you, what you might think of him, one of the good uh, outcomes of those years was the added pressure on Europe to get Europeans to spend more, to make more, to build more of for their own military uh, defenses and you know strategic capabilities, nuclear arsenals, you name it. And so we're in this kind of crossroads when when the Ukraine war hit, where you have you know M Macron in France pitching European strategic autonomy in this whole new way, something just below NATO, but for the Europeans alone less dependent on the United States, all the way to President Biden, who's more of a traditional transatlanticist and wants the, to you know, hold and bolster up the existing international system. That's a lot. That's a big setup just to say, what do you think is the future for European uh, autonomy and where, what direction do you want it to head? And I'm going to go with the I'm going to go with Alexander, who's smirking and I'm sure has got something to say about this because he seems like he has things to say. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, it's not, you know, when I was a politician, you couldn't say what you thought. Now they're academic. I can say whatever I want, but it's quite... This different. is my favorite moment in any politician's life when they can say what they want. Please no, do. I'm going to disappoint you. No, but, I, you know, I think there are people who say that um, Europe made two strategic mistakes post-Cold War. One was to rely on Russian energy and the other one was to rely on American security. Uh, I sort of disagree because the aim of both was actually integration. Now, we can see that we failed on Russian energy. You know, it, 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 now we're gonna to have to wane ourselves away from it and that's fine. But in American security, I, I, I still think that, you know, our capacity to find common ground and working together is important. That's why I've, I've never liked this sort of tension or juxtaposition, you know, EU against NATO. For me, it's not either or, it's both. Uh, and, and I don't like duplication. I think that's unnecessary. Having said all of that, do we need to have a conversation about strategic autonomy? Sure. Uh, you know, as long as strategic autonomy doesn't mean the non-yogurt, if you know what I mean. So, so you, know, it, 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 you know, it needs to mean that we create our own capabilities. That's fine, but not separate from NATO. And you know, what would have happened? if the US had withdrawn from NATO in this situation? What would happen for European security if the Americans were not helping Ukraine right now? We would be in trouble. So that's why I think, let's play it careful, let's cooperate, let's keep America involved, but let's give Europe a little bit more autonomy and a little bit more capacity. But I wanna keep the Americans in Europe for as long as they stay. All right. So, um... It's right in the in the last couple of years, um, there was a discussion on uh, and a row uh, on uh, fundamental uh, issues as to the degree of uh, uh, geostrategic independence Europe should uh, seek vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, US and uh, and NATO. And I know this uh, because I was part of this uh, uh, row. And um, I think the Russian war in Ukraine has for the time being answered uh, these uh, questions because the strategic uh, compass approved by the uh, European uh, Council on May emphasizes that the European Union future efforts on security and defense should complement but not substitute NATO uh, efforts. Um, and so um, I think uh, this question from the early uh, 2020s uh, is answered uh, right now. And uh, with both the um, strategic compass of European Union and the uh, strategic uh, concept of uh, NATO, 
um, uh, adapted uh, by uh, the, um, the uh, war in uh, Ukraine, we have a good uh, basis to act uh, and to react uh, for the future. Um, but despite the uh, convergence in strategic um, outlooks, uh, questions remain in how both um, organizations will uh, cooperate and coordinate uh, their actions. And right now there are some proposals like a joint EU-NATO declaration that sets up permanent joint dialogue uh, mechanism. And in this context uh, will be discussed the division of labor that avoids uh, duplications, identify roads, uh, and so on. So I think uh, now the situation, what should NATO do? What should um, European Union do? It's clearer than it was uh, uh, before the war on Ukraine. But uh, now we have uh, to provide a practical, um, practical um, answers and, and practical politics uh, to realize uh, uh, this, what is written uh, in uh, the strategic documents uh, on NATO and on uh, European Union. Those are, uh, thank you for making those points. As a reminder, you also mentioned the Munich Security Conference earlier, and I was I was at the twenty the twenty twenty conference right before the pandemic lockdown, and that was really the theme. It was what what is Europe's future going to be? There was uh, you know arguments about what to do with Europe. I think I wrote Europe doesn't. The, the, the Europeans and the transatlantic members, they don't know what to do about China because they don't even know what to do about themselves yet. Um, Steph, to, to you, from the American perspective, when you think of you know, European strategic autonomy is, in effect, also U.S. strategic autonomy, uh, what changes do you think are needed uh, um, or what may be already underway because of the war that's that's been forced upon uh, the alliance? Yeah, I, I would like to address this uh, dependence on the U.S. because I really do think it's a misnomer. Uh, I've spent seven years in Europe, you know, serving from when I was a major all the way up to when I was a three-star general there. So I spent a lot of time on the ground there. And I really have a lot of European friends there. And what I will tell you is when you look in the, in the big scheme of things, there are only a little over 100,000 U.S. troops that are in Europe now. So we're not the largest troop contributor in Europe. It is the, European, the Europeans collectively that are the largest troop contributors in Europe. And so when we say dependent on, on European defense, actually that's not the case. Sure, we make up as part of the other 29 companies countries, soon to be 32 countries, NATO, and we're obligated to help in that security and defense umbrella, particularly in Article 5. But on an everyday basis, what you have in Europe, you have a European defending their con continent, augmented by a small force of U.S. forces there. And so the Europeans are leading the way there. Uh, in, in my view, it's what I would tell you there, Kevin. Would you uh, then continue to, to drive it forward? I mean, do, and, and maybe let's pivot. We have, we have our, our last, I think, four minutes that we're in there. So give me, give me a final word about China, the Indo-Pacific, the, 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 threats, the threats and concerns of outside of, uh, you know, the geographical Europe when you think of a future strategy. Yeah. And maybe also talk about the industry that has to arm this, all these concepts, right? Um, uh, the status of defense industry in Europe, in the United States, what's needed to, you know, to arm and equip uh, the right forces that, uh, and, and structures you think are needed. Um, and maybe we'll do a, a final round robin and we'll go in that reverse order again. So Steph, you could start us off. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, if you're looking at Ukraine and Russia and taking this template and moving it to the Pacific, I think it's the, the wrong lens to look at it through. First of all, what we need to continue to do is to actively dialogue with the Chinese. Uh, I, don't, I do not consider the, uh, China to be an enemy of the U.S. They're a competitor. 
in so many ways, whether it be economic competitor, military competitor, you name it. And so it's important that we distinguish them as not, not as enemies, but we must be prepared to fight the Chinese if need be. And so when you take a look at the U.S. capability in the Pacific now, uh, it is minimal as well. And so there needs to be a continued force buildup. And all U.S. presidents have said, you know, in the past three at least, that we need to make sure that we focus on the U.S. defense buildup in the Pacific, whether it be our Navy, Air Force, Air Force or ground forces. And we're trying to do that now. And Russia is complicating things, obviously, but we're trying to do that now. In addition to that is we know that we're lacking capabilities that I won't talk about here in terms of defense things that are needed on the, on the ground. And our Secretary of Defense, along with the Defense Department and the COCOM commander there, they're working on certain things such as ammunition and radars and sensors, those type things to beef up uh, in the Pacific, just so we can continue the deterrence role that we're trying to maintain there with the uh, Indo-Pacific Command. And I'll hold right there and let others chime in. Thanks. Quick final thoughts on China. Who's next? Anna Grant. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, um... I think as uh, 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 NATO has said, uh, for the first time, China is a strategic uh, challenge uh, for us. We know there are issues and uh, uh, questions like climate change. Uh, uh, it, it can't be solved without uh, uh, China and without a uh, good cooperation with China. And uh, we have uh, um, very strong uh, uh, economic ties um, with China uh, in, the, in the frame of uh, globalization. But on the other hand, uh, China is a challenge because it is an authoritarian uh, regime and it will change the international rules. You see it uh, on his behavior on United uh, Nations, uh, on uh, uh, its uh, behavior when it comes to, uh, to deal with minorities uh, in, uh, in its own uh, country. Um, so um, I think the, the, the challenge for us in the future is that the log uh, sheets of uh, security and international um, economics uh, are no longer aligned, um, rather they are often in direct uh, tensions. And um, mm. this uh, needs a an, an, an certain flexibility um, of, uh, uh, um, of, of the states dealing with, uh, with China. But uh, I think it, uh, what we see um, from the uh, Russian uh, war in Ukraine is that uh, this war and this threat uh, um, put closer together uh, countries like, uh, uh, like uh, Japan or South Korea um, yeah. uh, to, to the Western world, to, uh, to, to NATO. And so I think we, we have to create an, uh, a network with like-minded partners uh, all over the world, as, uh, especially in the Indo-Pacific. And um, uh, we have, uh, and, and we, we will see, I'm, I'm very convinced, we will see a certain kind of, um, of a globalization that is uh, adapting uh, this new uh, uh, situation. And it's not so bipolar uh, as we, um, perhaps as we uh, think it is. Okay, quickly, final thoughts. Alexander Stubb, you get to take us out. I'm a fan, so I can be short and telegraphic. Number one, uh, I belong to the cat category of people who do not believe in decoupling, keep China on board. Number two, this war in Ukraine has a symbolic significance for all authoritarian states. That is why um, China is actually quite worried about the outcome. Number three, I think China might have reached this peak of, of what I would call natural growth, zero COVID policy. Um, with uh, combined with, with a bad economic situation has now led the World Bank today to announce that their prediction for growth rates this year is 2.8%.
So yes, there will be competition, uh, but it will not be a rival. There'll be a competition on the ideological side. There'll be competition in the economy, but let's not isolate uh, China. I think the West will have to readjust a little bit. Uh, good, good advice and sage words for all. I think if anyone wants to learn more about uh, China and especially China Russia, I would highly recommend uh, a little self plug uh, our China Intelligence series that uh, the author Peter Singer has headed up at Defense One, which is uh, has quite a few good recent pieces comparing um, the, the Russia's growing dependence and a junior partner status to China. And um, and using open source intelligence to to kind of piece together what we what we can know about China and in the United States uh, we were we at Defense One are keeping a lens on what I call the the battle over what to think about China uh, you know where politicians on one side call China an, a total enemy and if you do business with China you, you're not a patriot uh, and on the other side like we heard today ones that are more maybe pragmatic saying don't isolate them you can't decouple even if you wanted to. Um, there's a long future ahead that's, you know, part competition. But as Steph said, we need to prepare for defense as well. That's a tall order for any any leader right now. Uh, we're at the end of our session. So some final housekeeping notes uh, to, from I'm to read, which says, thank you for tuning into this conversation at the 2022 SEPA Forum, meeting the moment to allies at a crossroads. Please visit SEPA.org to view the SEPA Forum agenda, upcoming speakers, and recordings of the previous sessions in the forum. And be sure to follow SEPA social media accounts and watch the rest of the forum and stay up to date on the latest analysis and upcoming events. And of course, go to Defense One also. we got some good stuff there. Uh, our panelists, thank you very much, all three of you from, from wherever you are in the world. And I uh, hope you, the rest of you watching us will, will continue to enjoy the forum. Thank you. <laughs>